I, I really do appreciate your uh, presentation. Um, forgive me, I, I, I have to admit, I am not an Adventist. My beloved bride is, and I go to this church because Jesus Christ and him crucified is preached here. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Um, my question is this. I, you know, as far as end times prophecy, um, I, I see a great emphasis on that, and I've actually seen people respond to it, react to it, in what I would call negatively. Mm -hmm. You know, they take off, head for the hills, uh, whatever. <laughs> my, my question is, I, I, uh, and how you describe the uh, prophecies, um, I would say there are some, I may have some issues with it, but not really that great ones. But the question I have, and, uh, and I believe it's a serious one, is if everything you said is what's so, the next question is, so what? What do I do today? What do I do tomorrow? Okay. You mentioned about running for the hills. I live in Idaho. Yeah. I've seen some of those folks. Some of them are good and some of them are other. I used to live as a young man in the hills of Arkansas. And I, my mom and dad bought a over, little over 80 acres, eight miles from the nearest paved road. Not because they wanted to time a trouble hideaway, but because my dad was tired of living around lots of people. Now, he loves people. He just didn't want to have, he wanted elbow room. So we moved out there, and we had some people that moved up on that mountain wanting a time of trouble hideaway. Not all of them were Seventh-day Adventists. Some were, some were other. Y2K? Remember that one? My dad sold his part of the farm. He'd given parts of it to the boys. He sold his part to somebody who's not a Seventh-day Adventist that believed the world was going to fall apart at Y2K. He didn't care. They were buying his farm. But we had a neighbor down the street who actually had a bomb shelter. And this was their time of trouble hideaway. So they were home one time. They weren't there very often. They had another home somewhere else. And they were out at their little cabin with their bomb shelter and everything, and I went to pay them a visit. I said, if I d don't miss my guess, you have this as a Time of trouble, hide away. When everything breaks loose, you're going to go hide. Yeah. I said, it's not going to work. Why not? I said, number one, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. So if you come live out here and nobody knows what you believe, Jesus won't know you when he comes back. Number two, you have me for a neighbor. And I'm telling absolutely everybody I know what I believe. I'm inviting them to my house. I'm making friends with them for Jesus Christ. And if they decide they don't like me, they know exactly where I live. And when they come looking for me, they're going to find you. <laughs> so it's not going to work to hide out here by me. They sold their place. <laughs> <laughs> so I sympathize with your thoughts on that, okay? <laughs> now, why, what does it matter? In a world that's polarized left, right, north, south, does it matter what God's word says so that I can avoid the polarization and remember to love everybody and not get sucked into the deception? That's the value of prophecy. And when the world is thinking it's all falling apart, you don't have to go into depression like most. A huge percentage of young people are now fighting depression. But if you're focused on prophecy in the correct way, it's Jesus is saving us from this mess. Jesus is coming the Bible said it's going to get this way. It's this way. Maybe we're out of here soon. 
And that keeps me going for Jesus. That's why. <laughs> My question wasn't that important. Uh, I think it's a profound uh, statement you make with all of this information. Uh, I, I think that we should be opening our eyes and looking from every angle, and I think you've looked at more than just one or two. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to make a comment. It was interesting that the prophecy from 9-11 is not only in the Testimonies, Volume 9, on page 11, is also in the last volume of that series. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I would invite you to periodically read the first two or three chapters of Volume 11, 9. The last conflict, page 11, is actually the first page of the first chapter. The last conflict. Okay. And read the following two or three chapters as well. Just powerful stuff on how to be living right now. My real question to you is, do you have this or all of your information in a tracked kind of format? Or is that safe to hand out? <laughs> You mean like that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Page 11. 9 11. It's chapter 1, but it's volume 9, page 11. But you, you said to read the first three chapters. Read the first three chapters. Yeah, to read the whole book doesn't hurt, but the first three chapters are just really powerful. Tim, I got a question for you. Yes, sir. I know the counterfeit and Mario Murillo, they're moving really fast and huge. There will, as I've understood it, like on page 612 of the Great Controversy, it says God's servants will go hasten door to door, place to place, and signs and wonders and miracles will accompany them as they go and share yeah. the true testimony. A lot of Seventh-day Adventists don't know that as the counterfeit is happening, we should be doing the genuine. Is that your understanding? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. The real will be happening too, but it won't be happening in a flamboyant, huge... Mega churches, no, it won't. You be. just described one-on-one. -on -one. Door to door, that's right. Uh, anointings and stuff are done one-on-one, -on -one, not as a big deal. Jesus would often say, don't make a big deal of this. That's don't right. make a big deal of this. As he healed people. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Pastor, you said that the God of, uh, of Islam is the same God uh, that mm. we believe. And I didn't exactly say that. Well, something like it. Yeah. <laughs> you said that you could go uh, as a yes or as a no. Yes, I can prove it yes or no. That doesn't make the proof true. I don't understand. Um. You can argue a devil's advocate angle and make it sound that way. But the truth is that there are people who are following traditional Christianity and those that are following Islam that are worshiping the devil. They're following the for false god of force, fear, and anger, do it our way or else. But there are some Christians who've already found the true God of love, truth, peace, and forgiveness. And there are Muslims that are in search of that true God of love, truth, peace, and forgiveness. Now, Allah, if you trace back, is originally the moon God. Mm. Right? But if you trace the words for God, G-O-D, it's a Nordic false God. The English word for God has bad connotations in its roots. The Arabic word for God, Allah, has bad connotations in its roots. But get this, I'm in Nigeria with the machine guns in the doorway. And I'm preaching, and if I talk about God's judgment begins in 1844, I'm going to hear my translator say, Allah's Sharia, 1844. Allah's Sharia, God's judgment. You ever heard of how horrible Sharia law is? Allah's Sharia began in 1844, my translator says. 
and he is a Christian Seventh-day Adventist uh, union president today. He was my driver then. He risked his life with mine. There's a bond when you risk your lives together. And uh, he wasn't just trying to be politically correct. He's an extremely brave, bold man for Jesus in Muslim-controlled territory. And uh, when I say God's judgment, he says Allah Sharia. It's how the word is used. The papacy uses God's words and tries to make it into force, fear, and anger when it should be going another way. The same thing happens within Islam. There are people that are in search of the true God, and they're coming from both. So, so if we encounter a Muslim uh, brother that is searching, and he believes in the uh, Quran, and in the Quran, they acknowledge God the Father, but they, don't, they do not acknowledge Jesus as, as the Son of God, or a God himself, just the a good uh, teacher or a good uh, profiting even, but then so, do, they do not accept Jesus now, the way that Christianity or the way that we do. I am looking, and I don't see our Muslim ministries guy here anymore. He was here at lunch and was here this morning. Okay. Um, There's a guy by the name of Petrus Bandahar. He's the General Conference Adventist Muslims Relations Coordinator. Petrus is an amazing man. He can give a full on gospel presentation as Jesus is your Lord and Savior right out of the Quran. There's a lot in there that the Muslims have overlooked, even in the Quran. Uh, I need to study that more, but he is an expert in the Quran and he knows it better than his Muslim audience does. And he's good at it and he's led lots and lots of Muslims to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. I come a different track. Florida this last fall, we went down the street to the mosque within sight of the Seventh-day Adventist Church where we're going to have the meeting. We visit the mosque on Friday and tell them starting tonight we're going to be having this meeting. And a mu Muslim man walks in. Well, there were about five or six Muslim men that walked in at Friday night. And this one guy, he's wearing a T-shirt and big, bold, yellow letters on the back of it says, I'm a Muslim because of Jesus. He looks at around where the cameras are and he lines up with the camera so that any time it focuses on me, he's going to be right there in the picture with his I'm a Muslim because of Jesus shirt shining in the back. I'm watching him sit down and I see what's on his shirt and I'm just laughing. I found out later that he is a Muslim apologist. He goes around fighting with Christians. Uh, he fights against Spencer and against Jay Smith, if you know who those names are. These are Christian apologists that fight against Muslims. And he likes to engage with them. So this is a professional arguer that showed up at my seminar. I didn't know he was a member of the mosque down the church that I just invited to the seminar. That's okay. He's come here, he wants an argument in front of everybody. And I'm thinking, this is going to be fun. He's not going to get it. How do I know this? I've been through this many times with Muslims. <laughs> and... So I just tell the pastor, hey, when I'm done, you go engage him, tie him up for a while. I'm going to talk to everybody else, and by the time everybody else leaves, then I'll come over and talk to him. Why that way? There will be no crowd to argue in front of. And now he will be a sane, easy guy to talk to. And so <laughs> that's what we do. And, uh, you know, he listens to this first presentation, and he's heard a full-on gospel presentation in presentation one. But he's also heard how I'm treating both Islam and Christianity evenly. I mean, telling the truth about both. He goes, this is very unusual. 
I'm not used to presentations like this. He comes back time after time, and he, he ends up going, I don't know. I'm agreeing with you an awful lot. Not on everything, but an awful lot. Here's my observation. If we love Muslims, we're friendly with them, we're honest with God's word, we don't hide what we believe, but we're honest and we don't try to manipulate them, it starts working in. Just love them for Jesus. And if you want a good presentation, go online, find Petrus Bandahar from the General Conference. He's based in England, and uh, he's got great stuff. Thank you, Pastor. <sighs> How do you spell that last name, Bandahar? Oh, thanks a lot for asking that question. He's a Pakistani. Oh. <laughs> All A's, B-A-N-D-A-R-A. <laughs> Petrus is what I always go by. Pet Patrick? Petrus, just like Petra, the rock. Petrus. 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 Just add an S to Petra. Okay. <laughs> Got one right here. Yeah, he's General Conference Adventist Muslims Relations Director. That's another way of finding him. Yes, hi, Pastor. Going back to the question about uh, if uh, our God and the Muslim God are the same ones, I, I saw Dr. Dr. Walter Weith, mm -hmm. and he says they're, they're so far away from, from the north is from the south, and if anybody wants to, he explains it very well, the difference is Walter Weith, you can mm -hmm. look him up. There will be a difference of opinion, but I have a question. <laughs> Has anyone been killed in the name of God that oh. shouldn't have been? Very many, but that's Has not anybody been killed in the name of Allah that shouldn't have been? Yes, but that's not the, we were asking if they're the same God, and they're uh, not My the point God. is, it depends on who's calling their name. N well, no, yes. because the, the Muslim God is the sun God. No. The, yeah, they, the Christian God is the sun God, the Muslim God is the moon God. No. Yes. No. I'm sorry, I disagree with you. Okay, you can disagree. <laughs> Thank you. But I will just tell you this. This was so much fun. I was in, uh, doing a 10-day seminar near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Denham Springs. And there was this guy sitting right about here, and every night during closing prayer, he got up, and when I said amen, he was already shooting like a shot out the door. He looked like a Muslim to me. And I thought, okay, I'm praying the closing prayer. I've got the edge. I prayed while walking down the aisle. <laughs> I got past him before I said amen. I got to the door before he did. And I said, hi, I'm Tim. What's your name, Muhammad? Hmm. Guess my guess wasn't wrong is what I'm thinking. I said, so are you a Muslim? He said, no. I was a Muslim in Iran, but now I'm a Christian. So I looked at him and said, so did you have a dream or a vision? And he had this shocked look on his face. He said, how did you know? I said, because two thirds of Muslims that become followers of Jesus have had a dream or a vision leading them to do so. It's just a statistical guess. He said, yeah, I had a dream. He said, and I started studying. And here's what he told me. He said, I realized that Allah and what I'd been told, I was really just following the moon god. He said, so I decided to follow Christianity. And I said, so you went from Friday to Sunday? And he said, yeah. I said, so you went from the day of the moon to the day of the sun? He looked at me and I said, maybe you better keep looking. Think about that one. <sighs> Is there anyone else? Yes, right here. The name Allah, all our Arabic Bible, the God is Allah. There yes. is difference between the Muslim God and the Christian God by character, by how is the 
heaven by some beliefs, but they, there is sincere people and they pray for someone alive in the heaven. So the word even in, in Aramaic, we use the same word. Yes, I know. So it's not the name. It's the character and what it represents. Even Jesus in English is Jesus and then Jesus and Yesu. It's different pronunciations. But that's the difference between Allah, the word, we all use it in this, all, all beliefs. We use the same word. But the character, there Allah is more angry, more uh, strong, more hit, more love is on the side. So that's the difference between uh, the, the characters, not the name. It totally depends on the person wielding it. <sighs> and then they ask you, well, is it the same as the true God of true Christianity? And now you've jumped into a whole other world. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, there's a question oh. right there. When Muslims refer to the people of the book, who are they talking about? Those who are following the Bible. Okay. Because I was at Barnes & Noble one time and I met a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so he was asking me a lot of questions. And so when I said, well, I keep the Sabbath. and Because he says, what do we have in common? And I go, well, we don't eat pork. We don't. And he says, are you guys the people of the book? Yes. And... I, without thinking about it, I told him yes, but I wasn't too sure. No, That's no, why that, I wanted to know. I introduced okay. myself as a tr okay. person of the book and a follower of Jesus. Okay. Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you realize there are hundreds of thousands of Muslims that are following Jesus as the Lord and Savior and the Bible as their authority, and they're still Muslim? If you ask them about this, they will tell you we do not follow the Pope, we are not Christian. We are Muslim. Do you know what the term Muslim means? No. Surrendered to God. Are you surrendered to God? Mm hmm. That's interesting. If, now these people will say we are more surrendered than we have ever been in our lives but they're following Jesus and the Bible as their authority. They're keeping the Sabbath because that's what the Bible says. And because they are not identifying as Christians and follower of the Pope, they're able to teach Jesus as Lord and Savior and the Bible as the authority in mosque, in Muslim countries. God is preparing hundreds of thousands of Muslims that are already risking more every day as Muslims, as followers of Jesus in the book, than you are in your culture. But I've met many Seventh-day Adventists who say if they're not willing to claim they're Christians, they're not really followers of God. They are risking more than you've ever risked in your life, probably. And they are serious about Jesus and his word. Can I be a bit offensive? You don't have to ask. Okay, now, I don't know what you're going to think about this. I want you to think about history. Where have you seen that symbol? Muslims believe that if you are a Christian, you are a crusader, a follower of the Pope. Revelation 13 has two powers. Papal-led Christianity gets an enforcer. This one. What's your mind doing with what I just shared? Revelation 13 
has two powers, and you have both their flags. That's an interesting challenge, isn't it? I love being a U.S. citizen. Don't have my passport with me today, but I have been in U.S. embassies because I spent the night before being assaulted by people with assault rifles because they didn't want me in the country. Why? Because the priest was mad and I was presenting Jesus and the Bible in Ecuador with his Roman Catholic by constitution. It can get dicey in some countries. And I let it be known in the morning, I'm going to the U.S. Embassy, and I got a ta ca taxi cab, went to the embassy. And we told the hotel owner where this had happened, you tell the priest and the police, try that again, we'll make an international scene out of it, and I'm going down to the U.S. Embassy. I knew I'd be watched the night after the police hit us with assault rifles. In the two or three in the morning, it's a nasty way they wake up. When they come through your doorway in your hotel room, coming at your face with assault weapons, wanting your passports. It's called intimidation. So in the morning, I figured we were watched, and I went down to the U.S. Embassy. I did not tell the U.S. Embassy what had happened overnight. I didn't want them to agree and ask me to go home. I went down, talked to them about something else, <laughs> and it came back up. And they put a seal on the front door of the hotel, meaning as long as, saying that as long as we're there, the front doors must remain sealed. You open the front doors of the hotel, and you've broken a law, you're going to jail. They're sealed, literally. There's a seal on it. The two front doors of the hotel. The back door's open so we can leave. We don't feel like leaving. We put a guy in the front with a sign that says, hey, front doors are sealed, back doors open, come on in. <laughs> and our people kept right on coming, no matter what the priest said. And I think they weren't quite sure what happened down at the U.S. Embassy, and they were afraid to find out. If Paul can use being an American, I mean a Roman citizen, I can use being an American citizen. They were just in negotiations for getting rid of their paper money and replacing it with U.S. dollars. You go to Ecuador the day, it's all U.S. money in use for the paper money. I didn't think they'd want to mess that up right then. It apparently was right. <laughs> we got away with it. I like my U.S. passport. I like it when the wheels touch down in the U.S. when I'm coming back from Nigeria and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it in the top of the plane or a body bag in the bottom. You think I'm pushing that? What do you do when a taxi stops in front of your vehicle? What would you do? You'd stop and wait, wouldn't you? Do you know what my driver did with me in the van? Did it twice in one day. He slows down, hits it, and then accelerates to push it out of the way and keeps going, driving normally at between 90 and 100 miles an hour to make it harder to shoot us. When you're traveling like that, you start wondering about if you're coming home in the top or the bottom of the plane. It's also very good for your prayer life. I started out praying for my wife and I, but it quickly changed. There are pedestrians on that two-lane road that we're driving 90 to 100 miles an hour on. And there's potholes. And I began praying that we wouldn't kill anybody because I didn't want that on my conscience. And you know, when the wheels touch down in the U.S., do you know how good you have it here? Some of you folks know you've been in other parts of the world. The wheels touch down, and I know I can drink the water most places here. I know I can eat in most restaurants without fear of what I'm getting. And I can believe that the police are better than they are bad most of the time. That's not true all over the world. I know I can baptize somebody without fear of being shot for it or stoned for it. You don't have any clue how good you have it here. 
And when the wheels touch down, I'm glad to be back. But you know we're losing liberties fast. You know that both sides are trashing the Constitution. If the other side can do it, we can do it. And it's going bad fast. Make sure you're trusting Jesus, not this country. You know, your money actually has a pretty good lesson on it. It says, in God we trust. Don't trust money. Don't trust the government. Trust God. That's the only thing you can ultimately trust. Any, another question over here. Maybe this will be our last one. You got the last shot. <laughs> Are you recommended a uh, village church event happening this weekend? Uh, starts, I did starts actually this morning it started and it's going on through next weekend. That's right. Uh, I tuned in this morning at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> grateful for the three hour difference. <laughs> And uh, it leads me to that question that this first gentleman raised is, so what do we do today? And it's relevant to that presentation this weekend. And, and I want to propose the idea, and I would like your feedback, on California laws currently has just passed what people know is uh, against parental rights, accusing parents of abuse and possibly losing custody. We still have time to call Governor Newsom and ask for his veto on that law. And that is, quote, quote, getting involved in politics. That is Okay, exercising. great question. I, I love the question. <laughs> okay. So uh, what do we do on these yeah. political situations? I would invite you to be very focused on issues. If there is something you have an issue on, you address the issue while loving those who agree and those who disagree. Got that? Not always so easy to do, right? I'm very pro-life. Pro-family. I am those things. I will vote issues. I will defend issues. But I will not side with a political party because a party will turn on you and go a different direction with it. The only reason political parties typically use issues is to gain the power of the people that support that issue. And I choose not to be a pawn of a political party. Ellen White said something, if you vote for a person, you are responsible for what they do. So if the next election goes as expected for the U.S. president, do you want to be responsible for everything Trump or everything Biden does? I don't want to be responsible for what either of them would do. So be careful. Be careful. I will choose issues, but I will not choose a party. I've been around too much. I used to be a lobbyist for religious liberty in the Idaho State House. Depending on the issue, depended on which party was mad at me. And sometimes it depended on the time that the issue was being discussed, on which was political expedience, if they were mad with me or not. It becomes pretty clear. Oh, one last thing about politics. When they name a bill, you can almost guarantee reading the fine print, it does opposite what it, the, the title says. Over and over again, not always, but the majority of the time, the title is misleading, especially the titles the media gives it. Even more misleading. Just 
check that out and see for yourselves. Uh, so I don't want to be a part of the parties. I will talk about issues. Our founding fathers in the Adventist church, most of them were abolitionist. And they were willing to go to jail over it. They risked their lives over it. I'm glad to have that in our spiritual heritage. Aren't you glad it's not slave owners in your spiritual heritage? But the slave owners were in control when they were abolitionists. And the slave owners were calling the shots for a while. And it wasn't good for them. Some of them were tarred and feathered and hauled out of town on a rail. When threatened with that, Joseph Bates said, well, if you tar and feather me and give me a ride out of town, at least I don't have to walk. <laughs> he wouldn't back down. <laughs> he did die of old age, fortunately. <laughs> oh, she really wants to ask her question. Should we let her, Pastor? Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I just, in, in the first 930 service, you talked about um, hearing at, I'm sure you were talking about the Republican debate, you said when you hear people mention Jesus, I just, you said that's a red flag. Oh, I'm it's just not a Republican debate, it's politicians in general. Right, right. But I'm wondering if you could elaborate on what you were talking about. Just politicians in general. Uh, depends on which audience there are. But De Democrats do it in churches all the time. Yeah, but you said using the word Jesus. Well, Jesus, God, they will pretend to be Christian when their lies portray that they're not very Christian. So there's a red flag. Yeah. I mean, when politicians start throwing God's name around and acting like they're Christian, uh, not to so much be picking on Trump, but I'm going to use him for an example. Uh, he says he's a Christian, but when a reporter asks him if he's ever confessed his sins to God, he says, I've never done anything I need to confess for. Uh, which means a misunderstanding of Christianity. We are all sinners, and if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to... Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I ask Jesus to forgive me, I confess my sins, ask him to forgive me. I then am a Christian. And if Trump has never asked him to forgive him, we need to be paying for Trump's conversion. I'm not kidding. We need to be praying for our leaders. I don't care if you like them or not. The Bible says you're to be praying for them. Do you know who they were encouraging the first century Christians to be praying for? Nero. Nero, who was killing Christians. And they were encouraged to pray for him. We should have it easy, and it's not that they will die. That God will reach them with the gospel. The most dangerous thing is if a politician has a political conversion and says, I've been wrong, I've been, please forgive me, and it's all an act, but it would suck in most Christians. Again, do they actually start doing what the Bible says? I haven't found very many. I have found some politicians that are. They usually don't last a long time. And it doesn't work out well for them in politics. I was in a senator's office. And I was there for a Bible study with his staff first thing in the morning. It was pretty awesome. It was a good study. He got voted out of office right after that. I'm just here to tell you, some of those senators and people actually are seriously trying to follow Jesus and his word. They just don't always stay a long time. Okay, God be with you. We had closing prayer a little bit ago. It's been a joy being with you. Hopefully we can come back again. 
Uh, hopefully we can come to a 10-day seminar. That is really fun. You'll get to build bridges to lots of people in your community, and if fortunate, that includes Muslims. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Tim. Thank you a lot. I know everybody wants to give you a hug, but probably don't, aren't able to do that. But thank you for coming. If you want to ask you any more afterwards, sure. I'm sure he's, I mean, this guy's a worker. Islamandchristianity.org. Yeah, this guy's a real worker. Anybody that preaches two sermons every night for 10 nights, that's, this guy's a real worker. The most I've ever done is eight hours of preaching in a day. Eight hours. Amazing. <laughs> well, God bless you. Thank you for coming.